The speaker is Roland Bohr, who's Professor of Marxist Philosophy at Dalian University of Technology in China. Uh, Roland is a highly prolific author on a range of topics across time and place, from the ancient Near East to the Soviet Union, but all unified by his commitment to a Marxist understanding of the world. And this, of course, includes his latest book, Socialism with Chinese Characteristics, A Guide for Foreigners. Now, um, by my estimation, Roland's been either working in China or involved with Chinese universities and politics for at least a decade, I'd say. Is uh, that it's right? almost, almost 15 years now. Yeah, yeah. OK, yeah. Um, and, and, and one of the interesting things to me when I've worked with Chinese colleagues is this striking difference in scope and ambition. And uh, so when I think I'm working on a big grand topic, it looks very, very local, small and parochial in comparison with the kind of grand globally, globally orientated topic amongst Chinese colleagues. And I think this big picture understanding of Chinese and global society comes through very clearly in Roland's work generally, but especially in his work on China. And some of you will have a sense of that from uh, the guidebook. So what we'll do is have Roland speak for... 15, 20 minutes, whatever uh, works for you, Roland, we can be a yeah. bit of flexibility with that. Um, and if the audience can feed questions to me, can be sent through me in the chat function, I'll read them out. Uh, I strongly encourage you, of course, not to be shy because it's a great opportunity we have here. Um, and I should add, Roland, that, well, that Roland can take as much time to expand on these questions because we do have a little bit of time to play around with. So over to you, Roland. I uh, think thank you very very much James and thank you to the Northern Communists Northern District uh, Communists for the opportunity to talk about uh, some of these uh, pretty important questions. Um, I'm I'm going to begin with um, a quotation. Uh, it's become something of a, a guide or even a motto, if you like. Uh, some of you may have come across it. Here's the quote. I'm reading from another screen here. Uh, some foreigners say that our ideological reform is brainwashing. As I see it, they are correct in what they say. It is washing brains. That's what it is. This brain of mine was washed to become what it is. After joining the revolution, it was slowly washed, washed for several decades. What I received before was all bourgeois education and even some feudal education. Now, the pertinence of that will be is pretty obvious, I think. It comes from Mao Zedong in 1957. He was in uh, Moscow with um, a group from the Communist Party of China celebrating the 40th anniversary of the October Revolution. And uh, late one evening, he went to Moscow University, where about 3,000 Chinese students had been waiting uh, for hours for him to turn up. And uh, this is uh, a comment, it was a freewheeling conversation, a comment he gave to the students. But I've, I've found it a very useful way of uh, coming to learn about um, Chinese Marxism or socialism with Chinese uh, characteristics. And I've actually found that those of us like myself who have been brought in, uh, brought up in some of the few uh, Western countries of the world really do need to wash our brains more of the many assumptions that are the result of education, culture, uh, and so on. What kind of assumptions? Well, let's go right to the to point. These are even Marxist assumptions. Uh, these concern the question of classes and class conflict and the relationship with anti-colonial struggles for national liberation. Um, the question of socialist construction, how is Marxism, Marxist political economy, a guide for socialist construction. What's the nature of planning and markets in a socialist system? The question of socialist governance and so, uh, socialist democracy and so on and so on and so on. All of these categories I've found over the last decade or more have had to be rethought. I've had to wash my brain of the previous assumptions about these things and rethink them. And these are, these are some of the topics I cover in the book that uh, James mentioned earlier. But what I thought it might be useful or helpful is if um, I explain some of the, the background to, the, to the writing of the book. It's a result of about 10 years of pretty intense uh, work and a lot of discussion and so on. 
Um, it, was, it was finally published last year. So a little bit of a personal story, if I may. Um, I first uh, became engaged with China about 15 years ago. I used to go for short visits initially, maybe a conference, uh, discussions with a publisher, a lecture. And then after a few years, I began to stay longer, a few weeks for a summer school, a tour of red sites and so on. And in about 2012, 200, sorry, 2012, um, my mentor, uh, Yang Hui Lin, who was then vice president of the of Renmin University of China in Beijing, uh, said to me, if you really want to understand China, you need to stay longer. Now, Yang Hui Lin is a member of the Communist Party of China, and he's also a pretty good judge of people. He sensed already then, before I probably knew it myself, my desire to know more. And he offered me a teaching position at Renmin University, which I took up part-time in 2013. And then since 2019, I've been at the School of Marxism at Dalian University of Technology. Um, but what, what, what have been the implications of this immersion into China? and especially Chinese Marxism and engagement with the CPC. Well, the first one, um, I'm a bit of a hard taskmaster on myself. I feel you need to know a language to be able to study uh, Marxism in whatever context you find it. Uh, in other words, my motive, which is probably not such a common motive, but it was my motive for beginning to learn the Chinese language was to study uh, Chinese Marxism. They say it takes you about 10 years to become fluent. I've been at it for almost eight years with daily language study of an hour or more. And uh, it, 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 it comes fairly easily now. So I, I like to watch, for example, among many things, Chinese television series, a recent one on the formation of the Communist Party or the French years of Deng Xiaoping and Zhou Enlai, which is a very good series. But in short, I could go on and on about this. This, this long-term study of the language enabled me to dig deeply into Chinese Marxist scholarship for the book and engage with a lot of Marxist scholars and members of the CPC on these big issues. Second thing I began to notice when I started to get into the topic and explore it is there's very little Marxist analysis outside China of the reform and opening up uh, from 1978. Uh, what material there is, is really focused on the time of Mao Zedong and comes to an end in 1976. And I can say that I've found that the work by Nick Knight, uh, he's now retired, the Australian scholar, on Marxist philosophy um, around the time of Mao and also other Marxist philosophers remains the best material that's been written uh, in English. Um, so there was a huge gap of reliable informed research on the reform and opening up that engaged fully with Chinese Marxist scholarship. And I make that point very clearly that work that actually engaged with Chinese Marxist scholars about the reform and opening up, I found there was virtually nothing. And so I set out to do that kind of task. Um, the the third thing I came to realize, and this was already uh, 10 years ago, was, um, and it happened at a gathering in Wuhan, it's about 50% of Chinese Marxist scholars and 50% uh, non-Chinese. I came to realize there's a, a crucial distinction that takes place, or that's really important. And I call it before October and after October. In other words, between, a communist party that is seeking power through organization, long struggle, proletarian revolution, and a communist party in power undertaking socialist construction. Uh, Lenin once said, and I think Mao also echoed it, that um, uh, gaining power through a proletarian revolution is relatively easy. Now, we might not think that uh, in the communist party in Britain or in the communist party of Australia, but they said it's relatively easy constructing socialism is infinitely more complicated and difficult. 
The fourth, um, the fourth thing I learned in this process is uh, I started or learned to deploy a principle for engaging with Chinese communists and Chinese Marxism. Begin by listening with big ears and with a small mouth. Seek to understand and gain trust and only then can you engage in robust discussion and debate. Now, why, why is this principle important for me? Well, after a few early visits, I thought I knew everything about Chinese Marxism of course, and my colleagues and would tease me about it from time to time, a gentle reminder that I knew absolutely nothing much. And so I, and this became re the reality when I immersed myself more and more deeply, I realized how little I knew and how much I had to learn. Um, I'm not claiming now to have a uh, comprehensive knowledge of every single aspect and still learning, uh, but it's been a long road. Now, there's many specific topics we might discuss in the time we've got left here, uh, but I think we'll, we'll leave those, those to the, the question and answer time, the discussion as they come up. Uh, but what I do want to emphasize here is the importance of Marxist philosophy in, in China and its concrete application in terms of what is known as contradiction analysis. Now, this might seem like a really abstract topic, uh, but I think it was Lenin who said, without revolutionary theory, there's no Marxist party. And then without theory, we're dead. Um, but Marxist philosophy in China is actually known as uh, Kanjia Benling, China's uh, the special skill for looking after the country. It's front and center of policy making and thus far for understanding the whole development of socialism and Chinese characteristics and all of its different aspects. Um, I, I want to emphasize three phases here that lay the background for it. I'm actually going to go back earlier than the uh, period from 1978. First of all, Lenin, uh, 1914, uh, and his study of Hegel, but also an observation in 1920. Uh, he wrote, antagonism and contradiction are not at all the same thing. Under socialism, the first antagonism will disappear and the second will remain. While antagonism between classes, between forces and relations of production will begin to disappear in socialism, contradictions will be part of the process. Now, Engels was offering, uh, sorry, Lenin was offering a reinterpretation of Engels' insights from two deeply influential works, Anti-During and Dialectics of Nature. And from this engagement, the whole tradition of dialectical materialism arose in the Soviet Union, coming to maturity in the 1930s. And it was that mature Marxist philosophy that Mao Zedong and his comrades studied in Yan'an in the mid 1930s at the end of the Long March, when they had a, a couple of years before the anti-Japanese war became really serious. And they buried themselves in study, lectures, writing, translations, and so on. And there's an immensely creative amount of material that in many ways laid the foundation for the new China. And at the core of that, is contradiction analysis. Now, um, I think what I'll do is I've, I've got material here about Lenin's points and then the material in the Soviet developments of, um, of dialectical materialism. Uh, it's a bit repetitive in a sense, they do take it further. So I want to go uh, immediately to uh, the material that Mao Zedong put together for his lectures on dialectical materialism. And these come through in his his notes, his marginal notes and comments on translations of key Russian works. And then also from his lectures on dialectic materialism, uh, the text, uh, which is now widely available. I highly recommend you read it. Um, so I want to emphasize three features of, of these many aspects of, of Mao's thought. First of all, contradictions are universal in all phenomena in nature, mind and society and in a socialist uh, system, they're usually non-antagonistic, but, and here he goes further, they can become antagonistic if they're not managed properly. So that was his first point. The second one, and I think this is reasonably well known, there's always a primary contradiction that determines all of the others. Uh, a lot of research needs to be done to ascertain the primary contradiction. 
1937, for example, they determined that the primary contradiction um, was not the struggle with the nationalists, with the Kuomintang, but it was a struggle with Japanese colonialism. So they needed a united front. Uh, since 1949, there have been only three primary contradictions identified. The third one uh, at the 19th Congress of the CPC in 2017, between unbalanced and inadequate development and the ever-growing expectation of the people for literally a beautiful and good life or a better life. Now, this sounds all very abstract again, but what it actually does is it determines all of the policy moves and decisions uh, you know, you name it, from um, developing uh, governance structures through to economic strategies and so on and so forth, uh, and, and the way in which they're shaped. Um, so that's, and the third point that comes from Mao is he actually provides the philosophical foundations for what is known today as uh, Chinese characteristics or the concrete particularities of socialism. Now, Again, Mao takes up an idea from the Soviet works and sharpens it. But the key here is that qualitative change, real change, takes place internally to a process. And there's qualitative differences between different processes. So there's a huge difference between a capitalist system and a socialist system. And the qualitative change that takes place within them is determined internally. External factors play a role but they play a secondary role. They only make a quantitative difference. So then this is the, if you like, the, the theoretical background. If internal processes are the primary context for qualitative change or transformations, then it follows logically that the Chinese revolution, as well as the really hard task of constructing socialism, have their own particular characteristics. And then, it leads to Mao's observation uh, not long afterwards that there's no such thing as abstract Marxism, only concrete Marxism as it develops in light of a country's concrete conditions. And I've actually suggested that a better translation, uh, it, it shouldn't be tra socialism with Chinese characteristics. It should actually be socialism in light of China's concrete conditions. Uh, and this is not a new idea. It's um, but it's something that developed in particular uh, in that particular uh, context. All right, so just to sum up um, these, uh, these few points, um, these developments in Marxist dialectical analysis are absolutely crucial for understanding China today. And we can see it running all the way from Mao's thought until the late 1950s. Deng Xiaoping's recovery of this thought in the 1970s and Xi Jinping's new stage from 2012. And it provides the key for understanding China's economic, social, political uh, uh, development uh, since 1949. And what, one, one thing you do find when you engage with uh, Chinese Marxism is that it inherits and develops the full Marxist tradition the full Marxist tradition. It's not a truncated Marxism that offers only selected texts from Marx, usually excluding Engels, but in China, you'll find the full development of dialectical materialism as the method and historical materialism as its application. The reality of scientific socialism and the uh, distinct emphasis that Marxist political economy provides not only the best method for understanding capitalist countries, but also functions as the guide for socialist construction. So uh, I'll finish there. There's a few comments uh, for, uh, by way of introduction, uh, but I think it's also would be very fruitful to um, uh, focus on particular questions that people might have, and uh, we can discuss them further. So thank you. Thank you very much, Roland. Um, as we said, put any questions in the Q and A, and and I'll feed them through uh, to Roland. But we've got a we've got a couple to get started, and feel free to expand in any uh, any length you want, Roland. Um, firstly, is just, is, is one that you make a uh, distinction between typical Western readings of 
Chinese Marxism, such as the static, is it a socialist country versus, is it a process, is it on the road towards, mm. uh, and, and so on. And, and you make this, and you make a distinction, I think, between not just Western understanding, but Western Marxist, I think, understanding of historical, emphasizing historical materialism without dialectical materialism. Yeah. Is, is, is yeah. that, could, could you expand on that a little bit by what you might mean by these distinctions? And do you, do you see this as a dominant thing in the, in the uh, Western leftist and, on, and or Marxist tradition? Um, yeah, I, I mean, just as a, a precursor to that, I think one of the, one of the obvious indications that China has stepped onto the center of the world stage is the fact that, you know, nearly everyone is talking about China, has an opinion about China. Unfortunately, not all of it uh, is as well inf informed as it might be. But one of the, the questions that comes up, especially in communist circles or among Western Marxists more widely, is the question, is China socialist or is China not socialist? Uh, and it's very interesting the way in which that question is framed. It's is or is not. Now, there, it, 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 philosophically, it's a question of being, you know. Um, you either are something or you are not something. Uh, it's an either or opposition, which is a very characteristic Western approach. And there is actually not a technical Chinese term comes out of the Chinese tradition that's equivalent to the English word is or being. Um, but what you find instead coming out of the Chinese culture is the, the concept of, how do you translate it? Literally, it means birth, birth, shang shang. You translate it as regeneration. It's always on a particular process, on a particular path. And the terminology always used uh, when you're engaging with people in China is talking about the socialist road or the socialist path. Uh, and this is quite clear if you have a look at, you know, the four cardinal principles. It's uh, China will always be on the socialist road um, rather than, you know, is or is not. So that's the first point. Uh, it's, a, it's a basic cultural difference. The second one is, uh, and this, you know, uh, personal experience here, when I dug into all of the material on, on dialectic materialism in the Soviet Union in the 1930s. Uh, you know, I'd sort of kind of assumed, been taught, that all of this was just rubbish, uh, betrayal of Marxism and all that kind of stuff, and could be ignored. And I initially went to study it because, well, I thought, okay, so Mao and his comrades are reading this stuff. How did they get so much out of it? And I started looking at it, and I thought, okay, all of this has been chopped off, if you like, from the tradition, it's end up with a kind of truncated notion of Marxism in some Western circles. Um, and part of this is, of course, you cut off Engels first, you know, a few bits and pieces of Engels, we cut off Engels, and then all of the rest is sort of broken off, as it were. Um, and so you get, it's called historical materialism, which Engels coined, by the way, it's not a term from Marx, but dialectic materialism is, is dropped out the important distinction between utopian socialism and scientific socialism uh, disappears. Um, the crucial role, I'll give you one example among many of these dialectics of nature, Engels' text. You have this weird uh, sort of path of this in, in among Western Marxists. Um, first of all, Engels is dismissed and dialectics of nature is dismissed. It goes back at least to the 1950s. And then in the last five to 10 years, it has to be rediscovered because it's really, really important for you know, questions of environmental uh, concern and so on. You don't have this process in Chinese Marxism because dialectics of nature has always been an important text. It's a core text taught uh, for first year uh, science students. And the major research journal in China on science and technology is called Research on Dialectics of Nature. So these are just a few small examples of yeah, the way there's, there are these deep uh, cultural assumptions and differences in approaching these core questions, but also the way in which uh, Chinese Marxism inherits the full tradition rather than sort of cutting it off by the time Marx finishes writing. Thanks, Roland. Um, okay, um, okay, first one from 
uh, Martin. So it says, in your summary, you give a number of examples of how democracy works in China, but you haven't included anything about workplace democracy. How does that work in A, foreign-owned companies, B, Chinese private companies, and C, Chinese state-owned companies? Okay. Good question. Um, I think uh, there's two parts to the, this, this, the answer to this question. The one is a longer historical one. You have to go back to uh, considering all of the mass line work. Uh, in the red areas before the liberation of 1949. Why do I make that point? That provides the foundation for the development of an aspect of consultative democracy today uh, in China, uh, and that is grassroots democracy. There's now hundreds of thousands of different forms of grassroots democracy. The examples I, I give in the, the summary in the book uh, focus on regional areas. Um, but they also take place in cities and they also take place in uh, workplaces. Uh, there's another aspect, and these focus on questions such as um, budgets. Um, that's where they often began transparent budgeting, but then focused on a whole range of other areas where there's a, a very uh, clear process of beginning with uh, you know, um, feedback, uh, people are elected into particular bodies to look at a particular proposal. Uh, propo uh, suggestions are put forward. Uh, the local party branch, I'll talk about that in a moment, the local party branch and a local uh, committee will then come up with a revised proposal, which is then put to a vote. Uh, and then it moves. And then there's also assessment that takes place after that. So that's, that's one aspect that takes place within uh, uh, Chinese companies. How does it work with foreign-owned companies that are working in China? Um, most of those, as far as I know, it's still all of those have to work in partnership with a Chinese company. But the, the rule is there that if there are three, minimum of three CPC members working in one of these companies, they have to form a Communist Party cell. And the reason for three is that you need three people to elect a branch secretary. And in the larger ones, um, you have thousands upon thousands, which are then broken into different branches. Um, the biggest one is uh, Ant Group, uh, although Ant Group has been uh, under investigation like Evergrande recently, is the last sort of dregs of the wild 90s. Um, these particular uh, um, branches within the companies, and this applies, um, uh, you know, to both to, you know, foreign-owned companies working in China, and uh, Chinese companies uh, provide what is called the social responsibility report. These are guidelines for a whole range of aspects uh, that, um, you know, are reports on what the company is doing and plans for what the company is uh, moving forward to do. Um, the other one with uh, state-owned enterprises, SOEs, um, oh, let's just come and come up there, yeah, so it's just uh, maybe come in with that one a bit later. Um, the other ones with, with the state-owned SOEs, they've undergone a huge process of uh, reform over the last 30 to 40 years or something. Uh, and they, I think estimates now indicate they provide about 50% of the total economic output in China and hubs of innovation and so on. I mean, they are, the, the state-owned enterprises are, um, if, you know, I think as it's been put uh, quite a few times, uh, one of the crucial elements of the role of the CPC in China. Um, they are part of, if you like, the structure of the CPC or seen as integrated with the CPC and so are subject to the democratic centralism processes that take place there. Um, there's much more I, I could sort of uh, uh, talk about that, but I, I hope that's at least the beginning. We might want to sort of explore that a bit further. Thank you. Um... 
Uh, from Steve, uh, what has been the response to the last primary contradiction, i.e. the people's expectation versus uneven development? Mm -hmm. um, can I get a clarification? Response at a policy level or uh, um, among the common people? Um, I think I'll have to ask Steve to clarify that one. Yeah. If you can. Steve Hanford. Policy level. At a policy level, yeah. Uh, well, there, if you look at the other two earlier contradictions, there is a bit of a continuity. Um, earlier it was undeveloped, and now it's uneven development. So within each side of the, the contradiction, there are also internal features. So if we focus on, uh, just a moment, I'll find it again. Yeah, the uh, unbalanced and uneven development. Uh, this has been a particular concern uh, that has arisen out of the process of reform and opening up. Uh, and uh, it was something, first of all, the Eastern uh, provinces uh, took off and they're more in the sort of area, also the South and the Pearl River Delta, but also the traditional cradle of Chinese civilization around the, um, around the Hunan plains and so on. Uh, but what they found especially was in rural areas and especially in the remote rural areas in the mountains where you typically have a lot of minority nationalities, um, development lagged significantly behind what was taking place. There were earlier efforts to deal with that sort of thing uh, focusing on developments in the Western provinces. And this is, these are autonomous regions ranging through from Tibet to Xinjiang to Inner Mongolia and so on. Um, part of the, the emphasis on this in the last five years has to be to, to ensure that economic development in those particular places is a focus. And one of the aspects of the Belt and Road is to enable that to happen. So Xinjiang is a key to that sort of thing. Uh, Xinjiang also happens to have the largest reserves of oil in Asia. So you can uh, see why the Dalai Lama has no longer the flavor of the month and uh, Xinjiang has become the flavor of the month in that place. So uh, it's also behind the notion of common prosperity, uh, which has been promoted. Now, I should say a lot of these concepts that you see coming up are actually proposed during the time of Hu Jintao more than 10 years ago. So in a sense, it's a continuity and the current era has been uh, promoting those. The other side of that, uh, in terms of uneven and unbalanced development, um, you know, massive projects of rural revitalization have taken place and, uh, you know, concentrating on the uh, the uh, anti or the poverty alleviation thing. But the question I remember this when it was first proposed, what does the other part of the contradiction mean? A, a beautiful and good life or a better life? A better life, is it just a material life? There's always been an emphasis that the social and cultural life is also very, very important. Uh, word they use here is a spiritual life. Now, Jing Shen, problem with the translation of spiritual is in a Western context, it always has religious associations. It doesn't have that. It, it means the vitality, the energy within a culture. So that uh, of the old, you know, you go back to 1936 constitution. It's important for people to have a cultural life, to have uh, leisure, uh, to have holidays, uh, all these kinds of things to foster education, um, the arts, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, I think if you look at the way in which the, 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 the uh, policies have been unfolded and especially the 14th five-year plan, which came into play at multiple levels, I've even been involved in five-year planning at the local level of the university. Um, uh, you'll see that this drives all of the, uh, the issues uh, that are, or the policies that are being put forward and also trying to deal with new and unexpected problems. Okay, thank you. Um, next question, uh, Guy. Could you explain productive forces versus relations in production as non-antagonistic examples of dialectics? Okay. Good, 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 good. Yes. Um, 
where to begin. Let's begin with the Communist Manifesto. There's a sentence in the Communist Manifesto, I'll, I'll just paraphrase, where Marx and Engels say that after a proletarian revolution, the, uh, the working class should seize the means of production and that they should be owned on behalf of the working class by the state. That's the first part. And that usually leads, especially in countries that have got until recently, highly developed productive forces, a definition of socialism as the ownership of the means of production by workers. Second part of the sentence is usually forgotten is to accelerate the productive forces as rapidly as possible, or what is known in China as liberating the productive forces. So there's actually two parts, ownership of means of production, and also later Engels says control of the forces of production, being to that. And the second part is actually unleashing or liberating productive forces. Now, why do I begin there? Because in uh, 1952, uh, Stalin's book, Economic Problems of Socialism in the USSR, he makes a very, very important point that there's, during socialist construction, there will be tensions between the relations and forces of production. Okay, how's that related? Okay, so ownership by the workers of the means of production, for a control of forces of production, focuses on relations of production. It focuses on relations of production, who is owning and controlling. Liberating productive forces focus on productive forces themselves. Now, the two are always connected, obviously. You can't separate them and so on. But what I find is very interesting, um, you can map out a history of the three phases of China's economic development in light of this, is that typically in developing countries where there've been anti-colonial struggles for national liberation and communist parties have taken power, China, DPRK, Laos, Vietnam, they've never really lost the emphasis on liberating productive forces. And the key reason for that is that they were in abject poverty. China was one of the poorest countries in the world in 1949. And the question became, what is the best means for liberating the productive forces? Do the productive forces end up holding back the development of relations of production and vice versa? Uh, so that's a really core issue, a really core issue. Um, an overemphasis on one side leads to problems. Uh, you found an overemphasis earlier on in China on ownership. And that after about 20 or 30 years led to a huge number of problems. Overemphasis on liberating productive forces in the reform and opening up from 78 really just took off. Everything took off in an amazing way, but it led to a whole bunch of problems already evident in the 90s. And then in since 2012, now what they call the new stage, um, there's a move to sort of overcome the imbalanced emphasis of the previous phases, if you want to put it that way. Try to keep that one brief. There's, it's a lot in that one. Thank you. Um, I'll go uh, to Mark's question. I, uh, he says, I believe Telsa is perhaps the only foreign business yeah. which was not required to pair with a Chinese company. Do you know if this is correct? And therefore, is there any party representation in the operation? Um, I'm not up to date on the situation with Tesla. I'd have to check that one. Uh, however, the, the rule about um, if anyone is employed by the company in China, who's a member of the CPC, and there's three of them, they have to form a party branch, uh, and are also then responsible for the social responsibility reports, which will... Uh, determine and guide the, the company's uh, process, then this would apply to Tesla as well, even if it's not technically paired with a Chinese company. But I'd have to check that information first about whether uh, Tesla is or is not. Um, it'd be interesting if it's not, I'd have to find out what's going on. Okay. Um question from uh, Julio. Uh, he says, a bit more of a historical question. 
but something I've had chats with friends before and would be interesting to know more is the analysis that is done in China of the Cultural Revolution. Is there anything you can say about that, Rob? Oh, yeah, of course, very much so. I alluded to that before um, when I uh, made the comment about contradiction analysis, um, you know, being the feature, if you like, of um, Mao's work uh, and thought up until the late 50s. That's quite deliberate. And then it's recovery by Deng Xiaoping in 1970s. So why did I make that particular point? Um, it, the, the assessment is, I was looking at material around contradiction analysis with Mao, also a major uh, essay from 1956 on the correct handling, handling of contradictions among the people, a big emphasis on non-antagonistic contradictions, managing contradictions properly so they don't become antagonistic. And then what happens in the 1960s Mao starts promoting class conflict inside the party between the bourgeoisie and the proletariat inside the party. Now, there's a disjuncture between the emphasis up until the late 1950s and the turn in the 1960s. And um, so that's seen as and analysed as a leftist deviation, I put it that way. Um, let's come at it this way. Um, the term Maoism is not something that's used in China. In fact, when if they come across it, they'll ask me, what's this mean? Uh, you know, what, 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 what's this word, Maoism, Mao Chuyi? And, uh, you know, when we discuss this further, we, we, we uh, discuss it, we realise when it first arose in, um, especially in Europe, in the 1970s, Western Maoism, it really was a kind of construct. They had little actual knowledge about China. They had a few texts, but it was more to do with the internal questions within countries such as France, where it's very popular uh, and so on. Instead in China, the, the, this kind of thing is, is known as uh, Mao Tzu, uh, the Maoist leftists or Mao Pai, the Maoist sectarians. It's not Mao Zedong thought. Uh, so it's seen as a, a leftist deviation and is also seen as a very chaotic uh, and destructive time. But also then dialectically, here's the interesting part of it, it's also seen as laying the foundations for the reform and opening up because it managed to do a lot of the breaking up of things beforehand to enable uh, the liberation of the reform and opening up. Thank you. Uh, question from Ron. Can you elaborate on the influence stroke power that party cells have in workplaces and how companies are held accountable for social responsibility actions? Indeed. Um, I'll maybe put it again in terms of a personal discussion I uh, had some years ago with, uh, I guess you'd call him a businessman, a Chinese businessman who worked supposedly in a, a private company. Um, and we were talking about all these sorts of things. And this person had had experience internationally as well. And uh, we discussed some of these issues further. And uh, he said to me, no, look, doing business in China is completely different. Uh, and I said, what do you mean? What do you mean? Well, you know, the answer was uh, profit's not the number one thing. We have to be economically viable, obviously. That's the bottom line, the economic bottom line. But actually, profit isn't our main purpose. Now, this is someone who worked in a private company. Um, and so I asked him to explain further and said, look, we're, you know, we have these social responsibility reports. They deal with all sorts of aspects, uh, you know, education cultural development, environmental uh, development, and so on and so forth. Um, these are really what we're on about. And so it's led to an analysis by Chinese political economists. They don't, well, moving away from using raw terminology such as GDP, gross domestic product. Instead, the, the framework is what's called a gross domestic welfare product. G -W G -D -W -P. Uh, it's a sort of much more comprehensive total picture uh, thing that's taking place. Um, now, I, I 
probably haven't answered the question quite directly, but I thought I'd try and do it via this particular uh, conversation. There is, there has been just one other part to this. There's quite a bit of debate. This is more amongst economists and, and there is a big debate around this issue. So it's not concluded. Some have actually proposed that the distinction between private and public ownership is, is really breaking down. Um, it's more obvious that you don't have a distinction, a very sharp distinction between state and society because they're so interwoven uh, now that governance stands in the midst of society, if you like. But there is some say no, you still need to distinguish between private and public. Um, and But these are the ones like the Shanghai School of Economics who have been warning against too much, too much sort of private ownership taking place in China. Uh, they use raw percentages. The other side has been arguing that, um, you know, on we need to look at the picture more broadly. And with this integration of, um, you know, CPC branches within companies uh, and also the social responsibility reports and the roles of, of uh, grassroots uh, democratic practice in, in these social responsibility reports and so on, is that distinction as we've known it between private and public really viable? Uh, but that's an unresolved debate. So, uh, you know, there's plenty of debates around these issues in China. That's not all just a given. Thank you. Uh, okay, next question. While recognizing Xi Jinping's emphasis on Marxism, isn't there a danger of making an entity out of his thoughts? Doesn't that A, devalue the principle of collective leadership, and B, make it difficult to criticize potential errors? Mm. Um, the first one about collective leadership. Uh, when, when you're talking with, with comrades in the CPC and you push on that one, um, they'll always emphasize collective leadership. And the term that's used is not uh, Xi Jinping as the leader, uh, it's Xi Jinping at the core uh, of this uh, situation. And so in a sense, they'll emphasize uh, this in terms of um, uh, Xi Jinping being the spokesperson for the collective leadership. It's also worth noting that a lot of the material that is published, uh, speeches and things that are published under Xi Jinping's name uh, are actually initially drafted by other members of the central committee uh, or result of discussions and so on. Um, what was the sec? Ah, criticism, uh, oh, yes. There is an awful lot of that that goes on, uh, especially through democratic centralism. Uh, I'm not privy, of course, to discussions in the Central Committee uh, over these issues, but uh, there has been a certain enhancement of democratic centralism in that respect. Uh, but the idea of these sorts of criticisms, they need to be aired openly and robustly, uh, but then a consensus has to be reached. Um, the whole other question, the role of the press. No, it's not the role of the press to do that in a socialist state, but it's also culturally different, but that's a whole other question, I guess. So there is a risk, I guess, just one last reflection on this. There is a risk because Xi Jinping really, uh, it's seen in many ways as the most influential person at a crucial stage in, in China's development since Mao Zedong. And it's significant that it's called Xi Jinping thought for um, Xi Jinping, for sure. I mean, as a long phrase, it's uh, Xi Jinping thought of socialism, Chinese characteristics in a new era, or short for Xi Jinping. There is a risk of that kind of thing. That's true. Uh, and uh, I'm not privy to those discussions. Um, although I think, yeah, I mean, I should say, I mean, you're talking with rank and file members or people more widely common people, uh, you get sort of two responses really from people. On the one hand, you know, uh, common person, Lao Bai Xi, and, uh, you know, they usually say, ah, oh, Xi Jinping, putsu, you know, uh, in other words, not bad, which means he's really good. Why, why you ask? Well, he has the interest of common people at heart. So that's one side of it. Um, there's also a bit of a concern um, about 
too much sort of emphasis on uh, Xi Jinping, uh, you know, himself. That's the other side that's expressed in various ways. So again, these, these things go back and forth. Okay. Um, let's see, uh, we've got questions from different angles here, so just bear with me one second. Okay, one on the market uh, economy. So does embracing a market economy also mean embracing banking systems, stocks, shares, fractional lending, etc.? What is the Chinese position on this? Right. Um, I mean, the, the core question, can you have a market economy within a socialist system? Uh, that, goes, that goes way back. Uh, I think it was already proposed in the 19th century, but it was settled already in Eastern Europe in the 1930s that you can. Um, but there's some crucial uh, things we need to understand here, first of all. Uh, and I hope I'm not going over stuff people are aware of already. Um, first of all, uh, a planned economy is not equivalent to a socialist system and a market economy is not equivalent to a capitalist system. If you de-link those, uh, unfortunately, I think in, in Western context, they've been connected uh, too much. And the second one is historically, there've been many market economies through human history, but only one of them has been a capitalist market economy. Um, the question about how far you go uh, that, that's an interesting one, and I'll, maybe I can frame it this way by comparing Eastern Europe and, um, and the Chinese situation. Um, in Eastern Europe, as, as we know, in the 1960s especially, and uh, they started to develop with certain aspects of, of market uh, economies as part of their uh, reforms. But there were three aspects that they really didn't touch. Um, the first one was hard budget constraints, that is entry and exit, uh, allowing bankruptcy. And you know, in the end, they would not allow bankruptcy. Now, there's many things that can be done with soft budget constraints that can be made very, very hard at certain points. Um, the other one was uh, prices. And the third one was the law of value. They simply didn't touch that one. And it was a really sort of halfway house. They were sort of tempted and went back and forth and so on. Um, the way they've sort of developed this in, in China with a, a market component, there's also planning uh, been enhanced in the process, uh, is the idea that, that at certain levels, there is a commonality across, you know, market components within different systems. And if you're going to have a fully functioning market economy within a socialist system, you have to take on the one, the corporate the core things that are needed. So, but what is core? Okay, law of value is absolutely core. What law of value? Well, it's not law of value as it applies in capitalism, but this is a core thing from Marx. So you've had a whole development of uh, uh, the law of value in a socialist context, which moves much beyond that, uh, you know, use value, exchange value, surplus value, and so on. Um, you find it sort of focusing on a whole range of aspects and focusing very much on uh, if you like, the social product, the social value that's been produced from it. So as to the particular questions, I think the, the crucial debates in China is how many of these are core features of a functioning market economy and how much are peripheral. Um, so you do have, for example, a Shanghai Stock Exchange uh, that's uh, functioning, but the Hong Kong Stock Exchange is the key one, but Hong Kong is a capitalist enclave in China. We'll talk about that later if you like. Um, but how much of that do you allow? They're very, very careful in, and assessing what is necessary for it to function and what is unnecessary and act, actually detrimental to that. Uh, and maybe a good example, uh, George Soros has a personal hatred of Xi Jinping. Now, why? I mean, they don't compare. Uh, back in the, I think it was the 90s with the Asian financial crises, as far as I understand it, Soros was behind devaluing the currencies of some of the countries around there with massive speculation and made an absolute windfall. He tried the same in Hong Kong, but the People's Bank of China blocked it, all sorts of mechanisms to block it, because obviously this was a destructive uh, influence that's coming in. And ever since then, 
as far as I understand it, Soros got his fingers badly burnt. Ever since then, he's had a, a personal hatred uh, of, especially now, I mean, China's communism generally, but especially now Xi Jinping with all of the reforms later. So again, uh, sort of many aspects to the answer. The key is to assess which ones of these are necessary for the function of an efficient market and which ones are actually peripheral and potentially detrimental uh, to it. More of a principle than the particular items mentioned, I guess. Okay. Um, another question then, uh, back to the question of Western Marxism. Is Western Marxist tradition different because it's coming from imperialist countries, whereas Chinese or even, say, Indian comes from a position of being the recipients of imperialism? Um, the short answer is yes. <laughs> uh, I think, uh, if, if, I, if I may, I've referred to a course I've taught once already and I've got coming up again on Western Marxism. Um, what is interesting about it in many respects, uh, and it really you can say that Western Marxism is fragmenting and, and, and essentially its, its time is over. Uh, there are too many uh, Marxists now in the West who don't ascribe to the basic features of Western Marxism. Uh, we can go into those if you like, but one of the particular aspects, and this comes through, if you haven't studied, look at the work of Domenico Lasurdo, the Italian uh, communist uh, who un unfortunately died a few years ago. Um, uh, Christina and I have just translated um, an article of his that was uh, published in uh, German uh, some years ago on how Western Marxism was born and how it died. And this became the core of his book, the last book published in 2017, um, and uh, it was on Western Marxism. And he points out that what you find consistently in the, the heyday of Western Marxism was uh, essentially either an ignoring and sometimes for idealizing, but not the concrete conditions, the actual struggles taking place in developing and colonized places and recently decolonized places. Uh, and that ignorance is telling uh, in the way it also not just ignored, but then usually dismissed uh, in various ways, theoretically and so on and so forth. Okay. Um... Which one next? It's going to... Okay, um, question, anonymous question. The term socialism with Chinese characteristics is specific to China, but do you think that aspects of China's highly successful socialist model can be exported to other underdeveloped nations? Mm -hmm. um, the term itself is particular to China. I, I see it as, as overlapping significantly with socialism in one country and the Soviet Union, which was a necessary policy at the time. There's no mystery about it. You construct socialism as far as you possibly can. And at the time, the Soviet Union was the only place in the world they were trying to do that while always being on guard against uh, efforts, um, you know, by counter-revolutionary imperialist uh, countries to undermine it and internally. Um, it's they, the, other, the other term they do use, and this is a consistent emphasis, it's uh, the Chinese model, the Chinese model uh, for economic development, political development, and so on. And they, because they, historically, they, they did suffer under these, these controls from the Comintern. Um, and this is also historically in the 1930s why, um, you got the development of the notion of concrete Marxism in China. But the Chinese model and the way in which that is suggested is look at the Chinese model, but don't just copy it. Don't copy it. Look at your own conditions and see what works in your situation. And uh, I started to notice already, oh, look, seven, eight, nine years ago, there's uh, China's the second largest destination for international students in the world. 
most of them come from developing countries and quite a large number come from African countries. Uh, and more and more African countries have had more than enough of sort of, you know, uh, imposition by colonial powers, then by neoliberal international bodies for a time. And are more and more looking to what they can learn from the Chinese model for development and apply them in their own conditions. There's probably a way to go yet and, um, you know, all that sort of thing. But that's, that's the, the really the key one, the model. Look at the model, see what's worked, but don't just copy it. Look at your own situation and see what will work in your, your context. Uh, and this already goes back when Deng Xiaoping was talking with the president of Mozambique, uh, recently liberated. He said, look, don't rush in too fast. Look at your own conditions and see what you can do in light of your own concrete conditions. Uh, and that is the constant emphasis, no interference. Look, look at your own situation, develop things that work best in your situation. Okay, I, I guess it does lead on a little bit to the next question we've got. When he was managing the Cuban economy, Che Guevara was very concerned about the use of capitalist categories like competition and the law of value as encouraging individualism and the promotion of interests of individual enterprises rather than the social economy as a whole, hence uh, reintroducing capitalist ethos. Is the CCP aware of such issues? Mm. Um, the first one about your competition, um, I mean, that's a, that's a fairly old one. It was already developed in the Soviet Union, the sort of notion of socialist competition. Uh, it was seen as something as kind of, you know, uh, work production uh, stuff, the Stakhanovites and so on, model workers and things like that. Uh, so there is quite a history of developing an alternative run rather than sort of individual competition, uh, dog eat dog and so on. Uh, the law of value is much more interesting. Um, and... Uh, I've been engaged with uh, some people in uh, the Academy of Marxism within the Academy of Social Sciences about this one, uh, because that's often seen as, as a benchmark. If you have the law of value, then you must have a capitalist market economy. Um, but they, they, what, they, what, they, what they do is they take the category of there are core principles of Marxism and specific judgments in a situation. And the core principles continue, the judgments will change depending upon the context. But then dialectically, they go back and say, however, in light of experience, the core principles can be deepened and developed further. Um, and this, the law of value particularly has one that's been developed further. Now, I'd like to get... <sighs> sort of studied this a while ago, there was a, the team at the Shanghai School of Economics pioneered this and um, one member of the team, Chung and Fu, I think is more and more known internationally. Um, there's uh, quite a development on the law of value in a socialist context. Do you still call it the law of value? That's a question. It's certainly not um, the law of value as it was developed for, having, developed for the sake of um, a capitalist system. Now, if you like, I have to get the file up and I can give you a brief outline of how the law of value has actually been reassessed uh, in a Chinese context uh, for uh, the purpose of uh, socialist construction. If you like, you just give me a minute and I can get it up. Let me know. Just, um, just let us know in the comments uh, yeah. if you want Roland to do that. Um, we've got, we have indeed got a question on Hong Kong. Um, in fact, uh, pretty much asking you to um, expand a little on what you said before. Mm. Can you explain what you mean by Hong Kong as a capitalist enclave in relation to China and the development of socialism? I can indeed. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Um, all right. I've just seen the comment there, that file on the law of value. Uh, do you, want, do you want to address that first, Roland? Look, uh, no, uh, look, just um, it's on another computer here that I've been looking at, but uh, just give me a second, okay? Yep. Meanwhile, while I'm getting the file up, um, I'll address that question about uh, the Hong Kong situation. Um, partly, I do have a chapter coming up in a book I'm working on on Hong Kong and the rule of law. Um, we need to go back to, it seems to me, a concept that has been misunderstood 
and I think there's obvious reasons why it's misunderstood. It's Deng Xiaoping's uh, breakthrough proposal of one country, two systems. Now, this, this, this is a fascinating sort of development. Uh, and the word system is absolutely crucial uh, in this case. The country, I think, should be fairly clear. What do we mean by system? And I think usually in a Western context, we immediately jump to political system. But what Deng Xiaoping meant was economic system. So Hong Kong and Macau and Taiwan Island would be able to continue their capitalist systems for 50 or 100 years if necessary. The mainland would be on a socialist path and then they would have these little sort of capitalist uh, places also part of the country. Now this has been inverted, whether deliberately or otherwise, thinking that two systems meant two political systems. It doesn't, it means two economic systems. And it's worth looking at Deng Xiaoping's proposals to Taiwan Island, because um, he said, look, you know, at some point um, when the agreement is reached with uh, Taiwan Island, they can keep their uh, political system obviously running there for a while. They can even have their own armed forces if they want. Um, so it's a very sort of flexible uh, concept um, there's a whole other dimension to this about the history, uh, the long, long history of China and, and tensions in border areas and so on. Uh, but the other, the more recent thing with the um, situation in, in Hong Kong, um, what is absolutely fascinating about that is, uh, well, first of all, Hong Kong since the 19th century uh, has been used as a lever to destabilize the mainland. Um, and in the 19th century was missionaries, um, the opium wars, etc., etc. And you found this happening again, uh, Hong Kong being used as a lever to destabilize. And what looked like what they wanted to try and provoke with this color revolution or color counter revolution, you should call it, is that the PLA garrison would be called out uh, to keep, you know, order and stuff. And this is why you constantly got no, the Hong Kong police can manage. And they patiently went back in the National People's Congress and looked at the national security laws in Hong Kong and found there was a huge gap that hadn't been approved by the Legislative Council. So they took their time and developed a rule of law solution to the problem because of the robust development of rule of law in China over the last 10 to 20 years. And once it came in, it really, really, really made the, uh, you know, the old colonial and new colonial rulers very, very annoyed and angry because they've been completely and utterly outsmarted by an unexpected move. So, I mean, that's, that's, that's a fascinating sort of example, but it, it really is a good example of the development go back contradiction analysis dialectical analysis one country two systems just give me a bit and i'll look up that file uh, where are we um, uh, yeah from it's in an article that will be published soon it's from belgrade to beijing just uh, give me a second. Archive, here we are. All right. It's not, I haven't got it at the forefront of my head at the moment, so I just need to look it up. So I'll just look up um, Law of Value. <sighs> yeah, next. All right, here we are. Right. Okay, uh, I wonder what, if it's all right, I'll summarize the, the main points of this. There's um, uh, a number of book-length studies. There's actually a translation of one of the works into English now. Um, uh, it's um, the title, I think, is a 
creative labor or something like that. So what does the law of value, according to this uh, development, and it has been taken on in, in as far as I understand it, in, in uh, economic policy uh, making, uh, the first two uh, actually come directly from uh, Marx. So um, let me just see, all labor that directly produces material and immaterial goods for market exchange as well as labor that directly serves production, reproduction of labor goods are value creating labor, all right? In other words, what they're doing is, as far as they see it, Marx's uh, notion of the law of value covers two points, production of material goods in industry, agriculture and construction and so on. <coughs> Excuse me, secondly, transport or circulation of goods. We go into all of those much further. Then they go further. They say, look, uh, this is um, a beginning point, but it's certainly not enough. And so they introduce a third category, which is called intangible spiritual. Uh, now, this is where uh, spiritual doesn't mean religious. It means a sort of focus on the cultural uh, dimension. Intangible spiritual goods, by which is meant activities that contribute to cultural vitality, such as education, research, art and literature, media, and so on. The fourth category is the contribution of service labor. I find this one extremely interesting. When we think of the service economy or service labor, we think of cafes, you know, bars, uh, coffee shops, and so on and so forth. No. Service labor refers to medical care, health, sports, and so on. The fifth one is the management and direction of enterprises in the sense that such labor involves a management of socialized labor. And that does produce a surplus value, but what kind of surplus value? Is it just for profit? Oh, I think I've indicated before that it's not just for profit. Um, what are we up to, A, B, C, D, E? The sixth one, now there's changes in the objective and subjective conditions of labor. Now these have all sorts of complex outcomes, but Ultimately, the direction of those is to increase the complexity, proficiency, and intensity of labor so as to produce, improve the total value of goods and the total social value. All right, sorry, I'm, I'm looking at a particular article here. Now, that term is crucial. How does the law of value work? It produces social value. It produces social value. And so then, you, you get further added into this, and you can see that this comprehensive approach to these things, James referred to this before, uh, there's a comprehensiveness about it. Uh, you also have land resources, finance, ecology, a distribution according to work. Uh, there's a whole implication with that from each according to ability to each according to work. Um, and so you have what's called the creation of value by living human labor. Now, we go on with this, but I want to find here is that's right. So what you look at then is the increase in total social value. So law of value has become the increase in total social value. It's collective value, it's social value, or as I mentioned before, the gross domestic welfare product that draws together areas of economy, nature and society to determine, determine the final gross welfare product. Um, in a sense, this is the kind of Marxist political economic background, if you like, to the social responsibility reports in companies. Uh, my understanding is that the influence of this from the Shanghai School of Economics has influenced uh, economic analysis and determination of of um, you know Chinese economic uh, economic growth, I hope that's uh, a bit helpful. It, it should be out shortly in the World Review of Political Econo Economy, um, but uh, it's a very very interesting uh, development of a core principle of Marxism in light of deepening it uh, due to experience and so on. Thank you. Questions keep coming in. Got this from Steve. How much Chinese socialist development is predicated on offshore Western productive capacity 
and Western consumer demand. What risk to Chinese socialism comes from the decay of Western capitalism? Mm. Yeah, another very, very good question. Um, I think the, the best way to answer this is to look at the policy of dual circulation that came in a couple of years ago. Um, and again, they, they take an approach, uh, it's economic analysis, but it uses a dialectical approach. Uh, dual circulation, so the internal circuit in the country is primary and the external circuit is secondary. Now, uh, some analysts outside China say, oh, this is a response to the US instigated trade war and so on. Chinese analysis is different on that. They say, no, this is a, a shift, if you like, due to internal factors. And how is that? Well, a while ago, um, not so long ago, it was cheap Chinese goods that flooded the market in, in Western countries. Cheap Chinese goods. You go to, a, I don't know what they call it in England, Australia, it was called a $2 shop or a, something like that. And they're all uh, manufactured uh, in China. And then the sort of huge emphasis on, on qualitative improval, uh, approval, Im improvement, sorry, of, uh, of things. So um, now, especially in Western Europe, uh, you know, most of the, uh, the high tech stuff is actually developed in China or in close collaboration with German uh, uh, technological uh, companies and so on. So what's happened now is with that focus on the internal circuit, because the economy has achieved a maturity at all sorts of levels, the 500 million middle income group, um, the ability almost, uh, it's the only country in the world that has a complete industrial chain internal to the country. It doesn't rely on, on you know, in, international industrial chain things, except for some crucial areas. Although, uh, well, it's another thing, it's the old Taoist thing, it's Baiju time and Hydra achievements. They're already producing semiconductors in China. Um, so they're the only country with the complete industrial chain and so they can actually do this internal to the country and don't rely externally. It used to be that they relied on external trade as the primary uh, source. Now they don't. It's still very, very important, but it's not something they rely on primarily. The other part of this analysis is that they take a long-term view typically uh, on things and they have been analyzing from a policy direction what's been happening in Western capitalist countries for the last few decades. And they've noticed that economically they've been in stagnation and then decline. This has been evident since the, at the latest the 1970s and the whole neoliberal project was a failed effort to arrest that. Uh, and um, along that you've had political stagnation, fragmentation and now open social division and unrest. Um, and so they've looked at that situation as well internationally, again, analyzing internal processes in other countries uh, and uh, realized you know, that the reliance on um, external exports was something that certainly wasn't going to last. It wasn't in China's favor and it was only a particular phase of economic development, um, very chaotic one uh, with all sorts of problems as well. So again, a bit of a long, but a fascinating sort of question. Okay, thank you. Um, another question here from Ron, I think, yeah. You mentioned earlier efforts to improve people's cultural life. In a capitalist society like Britain, there are big issues when it comes to working class people participating in culture, producing it and consuming it. For example, they're priced out football games or can't learn a musical instrument at school because their parents can't afford it. Another example is millions of working class people buying lottery tickets, but not benefiting from lottery funded cultural projects, such as gentrification projects. How does this compare to the way culture is organized in a socialist country like China? Mm -hmm. uh, oh, there's many, many dimensions to, to this question. Um, hmm. Maybe I can answer it this way. Uh, well, there's two parts of it. First of all, the term culture in Chinese 
uh, Wen Kua, uh, has some sort of different uh, senses. It's much more embracing uh, than, than the notion of culture in Western uh, contexts. But let's stay with the, the category as it's there. The second part is that education is crucial, uh, crucial feature of culture. Uh, and this goes way back. The education reforms already in the first decades after 1949 laid the foundation for, I think, I think on all statistics, the most educated workforce in the world. Um, but let's look at a particular example during the pandemic of the last uh, two years. So uh, it's regionally determined how this works, uh, depending upon uh, assessments of risk and so on. But for quite some time, school students have had to uh, study at home, online classes, and also you know, university students. Now you can imagine the scale of this, hundreds of millions of students right across the country, all studying at home. How do you manage this? Well, at local provincial levels, uh, at local levels, provincial levels, and at national level, packages were provided to all families who needed them to enable children to study effectively and comfortably at home, and also the provision of adequate access to data or internet uh, coverage. Um, and this was material goods also, you know, uh, all sorts of things. And then you had the community uh, groups in the areas making sure that children, um, you know, where there were sort of difficulties for them with parents doing different things and so on, that they had someone there to mentor them. Uh, imagine that happening in a country like the UK or Australia or Denmark and so on. Uh, that's the kind of thing you can, you can get happening. Uh, you know, of course, you've got to make sure there's provision and that people don't pocket some of the money in the process and so on and so forth. But that's very difficult these days. Okay. Well, I think I have one more question, but uh, if someone wants to uh, uh, ask another, we can, we can, I'm sure we can squeeze it in uh, if need be. Um, why does the media, presumably Western media, speak of the Chinese Communist Party instead of the Communist Party of China. Yeah, I know. They like using CCP for some reason. Um, oh, there's a number of factors. This, I think it's also the continuation of using the Wei Child, you know, system of romanization instead of pinyin. Um, language is politics in these cases. Uh, my sense is it actually goes back. I was just studying recently the provisions of the Comintern, Communist International, and Lenin drafted the guidelines uh, for this, uh, which was then adopted. A number, of, a number of guidelines, but one of them in particular is that parties should name themselves the Communist Party of such and such a country. Um, maybe it's reading too much into this, but I, um, I suspect that there's something about this particular aspect not using its proper name is actually uh, an implicit downgrading, if you like. I don't want to say it's a, well, I mean, language is politics, of course, isn't it? In North Korea, they use the simplified Korean script. In South Korea, they use the traditional script. These are very political things. Never underestimate the ignorance of the Western press either. <laughs> <laughs> true. It could just be stupidity. Uh, it could be a little for me, a little from me. Uh, that's um, true. I think I think that's that's the uh, uh, questions we've got. Um, just for me to say thank you very much, Roland. And one thing I didn't say in the questions is we. I, I, um, I know you're shy. Is that? Um, a, a number of participants said how much they enjoyed the uh, the booklet and uh, how informative and educational it was. Uh, so that is also there, uh, but I didn't throw that in the question. So I want to keep this serious and not frivolous. Um, but um, but just so you know, it was very much appreciated. Uh, oh, uh, the reading yeah. really clear and um, a very complicated subject. But if we can, I mean, I, I know you can't really applaud. So if you can um, just show appreciation in the comments for. 
really engaging and detailed. So, I mean, that went on yeah. for nearly an hour and a half of mostly questions and answers, which is uh, pretty impressive stuff. Mm. So thank you, Roland. Uh, if I may say a word of thanks, um, you know, I, I, I do find this kind of discussion is actually, uh, uh, you know, obviously very productive. Uh, and so on, and, and I'm very appreciative of, of the, the core questions that are coming up. I mean, these are, these are fascinating issues that come up. And thank you very much for the um, invitation to speak and also appreciating the concise guide. Um, uh, let's see if we can talk more about it sometime. Yeah, absolutely. Um, plenty of nice comments coming in as well. There you go. You are loved. Much appreciated. Thanks. <laughs> All right, I think uh, if we could uh, finish the live streaming and okay. recording and so on, that would be great.